Rome Report comes to you from the Department of Social Communications, Catholic Archdiocese of Accra. This and every Sunday from 3.30 to 4 p.m. on GTV. Our family has spanned the centuries and the globe. With God's grace, we started hospitals to care for the sick. We established orphanages and helped the poor. We are the largest charitable organization on the planet, bringing comfort to those in need. We educate more children than any other institution. We developed the scientific method and founded the college system. We defend the dignity of human life and uphold marriage. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible. We are transformed by sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which have guided us for 2,000 years. We are the Catholic Church, with over one billion in our family, sharing in the sacraments and fullness of the Christian faith. Jesus started our church when he said to Peter, the first pope, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. So if you've been away from the Catholic Church, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. We are Catholic. Welcome home. Coming up in today's show, we'll tell you all about the Pope's meeting with the Vice President of the United States. This Lutheran bishop shares the unexpected result of dialogue between Christians, the initiative in the streets of Rome that remembers persecuted Jews. All this and much more here on Rome Reports. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence met with Pope Francis at the Vatican. What a great honor. What a great honor. Thank you. The two then sat down for a private conversation, lasting one hour. Mike Pence began by remembering President Trump's time at the Vatican in May 2017. Then the two likely discussed the situation between the U.S. and Iran. Vice President Pence introduced his wife and daughter-in-law. This is my wife, Karen Pence. It's an honor to meet you. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you. It's our daughter-in-law, Sarah Pence. The U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Kalista Gingrich, and her husband, Newt Gingrich, were the next to greet the Holy Father, ahead of Pence's delegation. Then it was time for the gifts. Mike Pence gave the Pope a cross made from a tree in the garden at the Vice President's residence. Every, every Vice President uh, uh, since Walter Mondale has lived in the home. This is a large medallion that was made here in the Vatican. Mm. Well, it's a land in the You see the angel of peace. The Pope went on to explain that the angel on the medallion already conquered the demon of war. Then, as to reaffirm the message, he gave the vice president the message of peace that he signed the same morning. The Pope joked about giving him each of his pontifical texts and his document on human fraternity. Upon leaving, the two shared an intimate moment. I won't forget. Then I already got it. Mike Pence told the Pope by meeting him he's become a hero, a comment likely referring to his devout Catholic mother. On the first Sunday dedicated to the Word of God, Pope Francis celebrated Mass in the Vatican with very significant gestures. For instance, the same lectern used during the Second Vatican Council was used. Following the readings, the Gospel book was enthroned before the altar. In his homily, the Pope reflected on Jesus' way of teaching. He said the long-awaited Messiah began his teaching far from Jerusalem. Thus, he showed that Jesus, the Word of God, doesn't meet people where they feel confident but rather where there is doubt and confusion to offer a way out. La parola che salva 
non va in cerca di luoghi preservati, sterilizzati, sicuri. Viene alle nostre complessità, nelle nostre oscurità. Oggi come allora Dio desidera visitare quei luoghi dove pensiamo che Egli non arrivi. The Pope also said the help Jesus offers can be rejected out of the fear of facing oneself in the dark places of one's personal life. Quante volte siamo invece a noi a chiudere la porta, preferendo tenere nascoste le nostre confusioni, le nostre opacità e doppiezze. Le sigilliamo dentro di noi, mentre andiamo dal Signore con qualche preghiera formale, stando attenti che la sua verità non ci scuota dentro. E questa è una, una ipocrisia nascosta. Eh? After the celebration, the Pope personally gave Bibles to 60 people from different walks of life. Among them were Italian scientist Antonino Zichichi and Rome's midfielder Nicolò Zaniolo, a promising player in Italian soccer. There's a special link between Pope Francis and John Paul II. Not only was he the Pope who made Jorge Mario Bergoglio a cardinal, but years later, it was Francis who decisively promoted the canonization process of John Paul II. Now, a new book gathers Pope Francis's reflections on Pope Wojtyła. It's entitled San Giovanni Paolo Magno and will be published February 14th. The volume is a result of the conversations that Pope Francis had with Father Luigi Maria Epicocco between June 2019 and January 2020. This work also has some unpublished episodes about Pope Francis's own life. Pope Francis likes the writings of this young priest and author very much. In December, the Pope delivered one of Epicoco's books to all Curia members after the traditional speech he addressed at the end of the year. Pope Francis dedicated Wednesday's general audience to the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity, which this year focuses on the story of St. Paul's shipwreck. The Bible recounts how the people of Malta generously welcomed him. Pope Francis asked Christians to follow their example. Tutto significa riconoscere che gli altri cristiani sono veramente i nostri fratelli e nostre sorelle in Cristo. Siamo fratelli. Qualcuno ti dirà, ma quello è protestante, quello è ortodosso. Sì, ma siamo fratelli in Cristo. The Pope said this demonstration of hospitality among Christians is a great witness which the Church must offer the world. Noi come cristiani dobbiamo lavorare insieme per mostrare ai migranti l'amore di Dio rivelato da Gesù Cristo. Lavorare insieme per vivere l'ospitalità ecumenica in particolare verso coloro la cui vita è più vulnerabile, ci renderà tutti, tutti cristiani, protestanti, ortodossi, cattolici, tutti cristiani, ci renderà essere umani migliori, discepoli migliori e un popolo cristiano più unito. A humorous scene played out during the audience. This little boy wandered up and down the stairs while the summary of the Pope's catechesis was being read in different languages. His antics got a smile from several people, including the German interpreter. Heiliger Vater, die Pilger und Besucher aus den Ländern deutscher Sprache. Ciao, ciao. This is Savino, by now a regular at the Pope's general audiences. He seems to be right at home as he meanders about the steps in front of Pope Francis and the rest of the crowd. Die Sie dafür mitgebracht haben. Es folgt nun eine Zusammenfassung der Katechese des Heiligen Vaters in deutscher Sprache. This is the second time the little boy is in the Pope's presence. He was 29 days old when the two first crossed paths in 2018. When we came last time, the Pope took Savino in his arms and blessed him. So this time we also brought his brother, Giovanni. He's seven months old now, so it's a huge blessing. It's an emotion I can't quite put into words. I thank the Lord, that's all I can say. 
It must be hard for parents to discipline a child whose shenanigans get them to personally meet the Pope. Giorgio and Anna say Savino often takes the same liberties at their home parish in Bologna, often walking right up to the altar in the middle of Mass. I was worried at first when he started walking up there. We didn't know what to do. If I had picked him up, he would have started screaming, so I just let him be. You never know. He does a little of everything, so he might have climbed up, down, or even gone outside. He even tried to climb up over where the guard was. Anna hopes Savino will one day become a priest, but she says it will be up to him. The family is going back to Bologna for now. But from the looks of it, this probably won't be their final encounter with Pope Francis. Philadelphia was once the capital of the United States. The Residence Act of 1790 moved to the capital to Washington as part of a plan to appease pro-slavery states who didn't want a northern capital. Congress didn't actually move to the new capital until the year 1800. You're watching Rome Reports. Coming up after the break, Spanish singer Rafael sponsors a church in Rome now open 24-7. You're watching Rome Reports. Pope Francis led the conclusion of the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity in the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. The theme this year was They Showed Us Unusual Kindness, in memory of the hospitality shown to St. Paul in Malta. Representatives of different Christian denominations were also present. St. Timothy's remains were present at the ceremony. He accompanied St. Paul on his trips and was the recipient of two letters from the New Testament. After Vespers, the Pope reminded those present that God's priority is the salvation of all people. In quanto discepoli di Gesù dobbiamo perciò stare attenti a non farci attirare da logiche mondane, ma metterci piuttosto in ascolto dei piccoli e dei poveri. During his homily, Pope Francis asked Catholics to be more welcoming among themselves, but also to Christians of other denominations. Many remember Bishop Munib Yunan as the Lutheran who, along with Pope Francis, commemorated 500 years since the Protestant Reformation. This took place in Lund, Sweden, four years ago. At the time, he was president of the Lutheran World Federation. He acknowledges that this gesture led many to insult them. Nevertheless, he says it was worth demonstrating that dialogue is always possible. Lund has created a positive energy, not only for the Lutheran and Catholic churches, but it has created a positive energy in the ecumenical movement. When the world sees that we have unity, they will really follow our footsteps. When they see that we are fighting, they, they will be far from us. One of the fruits of this event came months later, in 2017, when Calvinists, Anglicans, and Presbyterians also accepted the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification. Muni Bunan says the positive effects of dialogue between Protestants and Catholics are not limited to Christians, but have the potential to spread to other religions. My good you know, friend, Dr. Muhammad Samak, wrote about this positive energy. Uh, he is the uh, leader, or one of the leaders of Islam in Beirut for dialogue. He wrote, you know, that we have to learn as Muslims from, uh, uh, from, uh, how, from Lutherans and Catholics, how to reconcile as Shiites and Sunnis and not to keep it for 500 years. He recalls that one of the missions of every religion is to teach coexistence between people of diverse backgrounds. He says that's why extremism is a big enemy. Bishop Yunan is now retired, but lives in Jerusalem and travels around the world spreading this message.
Nation. This parish in the heart of Rome is open 24 hours a day for the people who need it most, the homeless. Now we'll also have these new simple beds so 90 people do not have to sleep outside during the cold winter nights. This initiative was launched by the Spanish NGO, Messengers of Peace. Thanks to this, we see how society is not sick. On the contrary, it is healthy, helpful, and rich in values. Call it what you want, but people will always be supportive. Ask, open your arms, and receive. This place is an example of that. The famous Spanish singer Rafael, who sold more than 50 million records throughout his successful career, traveled to Rome to sponsor both the opening of the room and this humanitarian organization. This is good charity and hopefully it will be very successful and multiply, like bread and fish. The important thing is the people themselves support these projects, be they famous or not. It does not matter. Before God and all important things, it doesn't matter if a person is famous or not. A few hours earlier, both Father Angel and Rafael attended Mass at Casa Santa Marta with the Pope. They explained this project to the Pope and gave him a very special gift. We met in Buenos Aires a while ago, but this time, knowing that he is very fond of tango, I brought him my personal tango album. It was a beautiful moment. The Pope wrote us a beautiful letter when he opened this church to the homeless. He told us he was glad there were churches open 24 hours because some look more like museums they have been closed for so long. In the Eternal City, this church is the opposite. It represents what Pope Francis has so often asked, for churches to be a field hospital for those who suffer the wounds of this world, both in their soul and on their body. Which artist has won the most Grammy Awards? John Williams, Beyonce, George Solti. You're watching Rome Reports. Which artist has won the most Grammy Awards? John Williams, Beyonce, George Solti. The correct answer is C. George Solti, an orchestral conductor, holds 31 Grammy Awards. You're watching Rome Reports. I don't think I'm at a point yet, or I don't think the artificial intelligence is at a point yet where uh, I should be overly concerned, but I think you can create scenarios with where you see it going that uh, I think you can, it would, it would cause concern. In some ways I am because um, I think we're in a market, global market, where um, when we have that type of advancement, uh, some countries can't compete with others when it comes to that. I believe that um, when it comes to jobs, it, it, it may actually reduce um, the job market for people to be able to work. Yes, I am concerned about it. I think um, one of the things that concerns me is where, where my phone seems to know it, wherever I am. It, it's, uh, it automatically locates where I am, where, wherever in the world. Um, and it knows where I've been. So that's a concern. <laughs> I'm not even sure where I am myself half the time. Yes, I am. Um, banking and everything, is, they're all trying to push us to go online. We, I don't want to go online. Um, I'm just about to get broadband to get the internet at home. Um, but you're being pushed into it. Or whatever work, the, the job that I'm doing, I have to do e-learning to keep up with health and safety. It's all online. A year ago in the Vatican, the Pope met with Brad Smith, president of Microsoft. Both believe artificial intelligence research should be based on firm ethical foundations. As a result, they will meet again at the end of February to sign the call for ethics. John Kelly III, executive vice president of IBM, will also participate. Issues like facial recognition are extremely important. There's also the question of asking companies how they're using our personal information. Fabrizio Mastrofini is one of the organizers of the summit to take place in the Vatican at the end of February. 
The event will bring experts together to better understand ethics in artificial intelligence. This technology is already yielding positive results in fields like health, defense, and finance. However, it is unknown whether or not the data it compiles will discriminate against users. Companies like Microsoft and IBM contacted Vincenzo Paglia, president of the Pontifical Academy for Life. They feel the increased importance of ethics in technology. Companies that are sensitive to users' needs perceive the responsibility technological progress brings. For now, only Microsoft and IBM intend to sign the call for ethics. The Vatican says if other companies want to join, they are welcome. David Sassoli, president of the European Parliament, and Ku Dong Yu, director general of the FAO, will also attend the signing. The event will take place February 28 and is open to the public. Anyone who wants to participate can sign up on the Pontifical Academy for Life website. January 27th is the International Day of Commemoration in memory of the victims of the Holocaust. Se perdiamo la memoria, annientiamo il futuro. L'anniversario dell'indicibile crudeltà che l'umanità scoprì 75 anni fa sia un richiamo a fermarci, a stare in silenzio, a fare memoria. Ci serve per non diventare an estimated 1.1 million people lost their lives in the Auschwitz-Birkenau compound during its four years of operation. This camp of horror caused the last three popes to feel the same pain. John Paul II was there in 1979. It was an especially significant visit for him, since he had experienced firsthand the suffering caused by totalitarianism. However, it was a German pope's visit that was more highly anticipated. Benedict XVI went to Auschwitz to pray in 2006. In a luogo come questo vengono meno le parole. In fondo può restare soltanto uno spigottito silenzio. Un silenzio che è un interiore grido verso Dio. Perché, Signore, hai taciuto? That day, after Benedict's prayer, a rainbow appeared in the sky. In front of so much pain, Pope Francis, in 2016, sat for 15 minutes of silent prayer. He also kissed some of the sites where so much suffering took place, like the execution wall. Quanto dolore! Quanta crudeltà! Ma è possibile che noi, uomini, creati a somiglianza di Dio, These sentiments permeated one of the darkest periods of the 20th century. Its history and those who died should be remembered, so this horror is never forgotten nor repeated in the future. These brass plaques can be found scattered throughout the Eternal City. They stand out against the gray backdrop of the Roman sidewalks, sometimes enough to make passers-by stop for a closer look. They are called Pietre d'Inciampo, in English, stumbling blocks. They are drilled into the ground in front of the former homes of those killed during Nazi occupation. The Memoria d'Inciampo project was brought to Rome in 2010 by Adachiara Zevi, who was struck by the initiative when she first saw it in other European cities. Some people, like Paola Carlini, have attended the event each year since its inception. The project brings the drama of the show to concrete everyday life. We can see the doors through which these people left their homes to go to the extermination camps. Even passers-by see them. Perhaps they wonder about them. To me, it seems important, as a way also to not lose the memory. Renato Villoresi once lived in what is now the Embassy of Argentina in Rome. He was killed in 1944 when he was just 27 years old. He showed courage and coherence in his decisions. He fought Nazism and fascism at the cost of his life. He sacrificed his own life for his ideas, for his beliefs. He was from a military family, so this vocation to military life was quite common in this household. Then, during the German occupation of Rome, he went out with a group who actually fought the Germans. He was arrested and taken to the Ardiatin caves, where he was killed along with all the other martyrs found there. 
A group of middle school students and their teachers put together this short book called A Boy Named Renato to tell the young man's story. Members of the Granatieri of Sardinia, the military force Renato belonged to, were also present. I think it's fundamental for students to know their history, the history of their city, the history of these people after whom our streets and school are named. I think for them it means rediscovering the things they always take for granted, because really there's nothing to be taken for granted in what we live today. A few blocks away, Elena Camerino and Ricardo Guido Luzzato's names were placed side by side in front of this unassuming building, between a pizzeria and a tobacco shop. Elena Camerino, and Ricardo Guido Elena Camerino and Ricardo Guido Luzzato were a married couple deported to Auschwitz, where they found death the day their convoy arrived. With this initiative and the installation of these two blocks, we want to remember where they lived. It's an important initiative for the city of Rome. Today, these two stumbling blocks add two more marks to the map of memory. This year, the addition of 34 new blocks brings the total to 341 in Rome alone. It is but a fraction of the millions of people killed in Europe during this tragic period in history. In our next program, we'll show you the Pope's Mass with thousands of religious men and women. This and much more here on Rome Reports. If your life were like a blueprint for a house, what would it look like? Would there be many different rooms? A room to represent the choices you make when you are with your family, and another for how you live when you are at work or out with your friends? Well, if we truly want to follow Christ, our house should have only one room, and at its center should be love. See, the scriptures tell us that at every moment, regardless of the circumstance, we must do what love requires. This is the fundamental vocation of every baptized Catholic. If we choose to follow God in love part of the time and turn away from love at other times, we are telling God maybe instead of yes. Our maybe to God becomes a barrier in our relationship with Him. His house truly has only one room and it is filled with love. He gave us the perfect example of how to say yes. What will we say in return? Live true. Live Catholic. Live Catholic. For over 2,000 years, the Catholic Church has consistently transformed true sacred scriptures and sacred tradition. It is comforting to know that some things remain consistent. Live truth, live Catholic. Visit our shop at Shiashi, opposite Gethsemane Cemetery, and find for yourselves the following Monstrance, Chalice, Candles, Clerical Sheds, Bibles, Writings of the Early Church Fathers, and other sacramentals. For more information, contact Live Truth, Live Catholic Bookshop on 020-222-0376 or 024-960-6155. Live Truth, Live Catholic, your number one stop shop for your religious items. Rome Report comes to you from the Department of Social Communications, Catholic Archdiocese of Accra. This and every Sunday from 3.30 to 4 p.m. on GTV.